so the sex episode that Mary spoke about, uh, seen in that first slide, um, it was not found by intelligent design. Um, in fact, um, I didn't know at the time that I found that, that there were such things as sex differences in the brain. And I did a developmental study trying to figure out when do you see basic pressing immersion in the brain. And I got messy, messy results. There was insomnia in the result. Basic pressing fire. So we were doing during the There was nothing that could be found. And so we did a number of things. We just get uh, um, to lose that variability, which is not necessarily the smartest thing to do as a biologist. But one of them is just from hackathons, hackathons and those treatments. And that just showed that very early on there's uh, the basic prison system is developed rather robustly in males, but stays behind and actually stays behind for the rest of their life um, in female rats. So that's the sex prison system around which I'm going to uh, spin this story. Um, and one of the things that uh, I'd like to do for one of the is uh, make a pitch for this, this new organization. Um, and, and it should be completely wide. And I have the feeling that in doing that, so in the general uh, public, I have to sort of swim up against the stream in that there have been recently a number of publications uh, that have really got a lot of press. And uh, the thing is, they aren't even bad publications at all. And those people uh, came up with some strong arguments why you should take studies. Um, on sex differences in the brain and sex differences in cognitive function with a grain of salt. Um, and one of the solution this was uh, made by Cordelia Fine, and it's, it's a funny and, and, well, uh, and a good read. Um, but I disagree with a number of things, um, especially um, the idea that just in general, Search of uh, sex differences in the brain leads nowhere. But there are a number of uh, arguments that, that she brings up and that, that uh, people like her bring up. And that is that if you look at that, um, if you look, for instance, to these big claims of sex differences in cognitive function, the differences that people found are really that impressive. So here is a rather well, famous figure uh, of a um, review that. Doreen Kimura wrote 30 years ago, and it was published in Scientific America. And it, and it lists a couple of its famous sex differences. The one that you know probably is the mental rotation of objects. Um, which, and another one that you might want to know, this is something that, that males presumably are better in. Detail orientation is something that, that females are better in. So females would be much better to figure out spot the differences in that series of homes that you see here, whereas males would rather quickly figure out which of these uh, uh, figures here correspond to the figure that's in the first panel. But there are a couple of reasons why you should take that type of study in the brain of soul. Very often, when you look at the actual distribution of the differences in performance, they're not that impressive. So there might be a mean that is different, but the overlap in many of these cases is much more impressive than the difference. The other thing is that many of these differences are, um, let's see, the other thing, no, <laughs> right, this might come up. Um, <laughs> yeah, what about that? <coughs> so this is just something that, it's a certain amount of differences, the one behind it infamous sex difference and it's not so good and for males in that for instance when you look at behaviors like home and homicide uh, males certainly outperform the females in dramatic ways this is just something that I pulled from uh, the website of the Bureau of Social Justice Statistics and it shows here for instance that if you just look at brothers killed by a sibling that in most cases siblings are killed by a brother um, are never by a sister and you can do the same for uh, Side, things like that. And in most cases, it's the middle of it. In an in incredible way, outperform the females. And why is this the case? But another thing is that many of these sex differences really depend on, uh, on context. So 
so this is very famous example. Um, this rotation cycle we use seeds, which of these things fits with this. So people that see it now, raise your hand. Look around and look at the, the sex. <laughs> so it could be that we look at the sex difference in the cash flow, right? And that the women were sticking out their, their hands. But it was the male hands that came up first. Um, a very bad experience from my time. <laughs> but so there was an interesting paper that appeared in Formos in the Daily, where instead of blocks, <coughs> figurines. Let me see if I can reload it up. In this case, you see this, this lady, which of these figures that corresponds. I said, I said, now, right, the much interesting evenly distribution, but either it was a pure depression was completely <coughs> or. It was indeed something that these people found, that when you use figurines, that you erase the sex difference. So here you see the data. And if you use the block figures, you get this gold standard of what everybody always knows, males outperforming females. But when you look at the uh, figurines and you use female figures, you have no sex difference whatsoever. Interestingly enough, when you use male figurines, you still have a sex level. So I have no clue why that is the case. But then, data like this suggests to me that if you go to a yoga class and you want the males to do a little bit better, you should have a male yoga instructors too. <laughs> Same as might be true from ballet lessons, etc. So, another thing that you often hear is um, that people say, well, it's not really biology, it's the way that people are brought up that causes these differences to be there. And this, the, the following story is something that, uh, that was shown in a different way here at Emory uh, at the University of Tumac in Baden. They, they were related to the look exactly the same experiment. And, um, this was an experiment that was done by Melissa Hines, who uh, uh, had been very interested in in uh, gender typical behaviors and sex differences in it. And um, she did this experiment where uh, she had humans sit in a circle, whether they uh, uh, gender neutral or masculine or feminine toys. And then the kids could just pick and they were scoring <coughs> what toys the kids gravitated to. And then uh, you could see through your sex differences that the males were much more opinionated with what toys they, they would want to play with. Than, than, than the girls who made much less of a difference. But the interesting thing was that if instead of uh, humans they were using vervet monkeys, and they did exactly the same experiment, they had to sit in a circle and, and they would pick toys, that the sex difference was not very different. Now there's absolutely no way, of course, that vervet uh, uh, monkey fathers and vervet monkey uh, mothers told the kids to play with, with uh, fire and puppets and things like that. So again, I have no clue what the difference means, but it's highly intriguing. But I think there are more important reasons why you should be interested in sex differences. Um, the way that I used to um, defend this, this uh, uh, habit was that if you look at sex differences, uh, it gives you this unique opportunity to compare the structure to the function. Uh, so you, you see a sex difference in the brain, you can correlate the sex differences in, in behavior, sex differences in the brain, the brain wants the, 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 the body. Um, in the same way, it gives you this unique view on brain development. So here you have this process that early in life, by a way that you sort of understand, you can send the brain in a male or in a female direction, and say um, that is at a stage where most of the major compartments of components of the brain are already there. So it's really a way that you can understand how the brain generates male or female specific processes. That's one reason. Um, the other reason is clinical. That is that the more impressive sex differences that you can find in cognitive behavior, you can find in the instance, the chances that you get a certain illness. And I um, listed <coughs> Just a couple of them here. Um, I'm sure you know most of them. Like autism, you're much more likely to become autistic if you're a 
avoid it for the more likely to become depressed if you are going to the man. Um, so having said that, I've given you these reasons. I also have to instantly come clean and tell you that this nice promise that you are going to find out about all these things when you study sex offices. Um, nobody has really been different about this. In most cases, we have no clue what sex differences in the brain are doing. So the big one that says what is it doing? Hardly ever do you have to do that. Um, we have learned from studying sex differences how brains are well. <coughs> that works well. But this list that you see there, um, in most cases we have, again, no clue why we have such an investment sex differences. Uh, in most cases we don't. There, there are exceptions, like red <coughs> um, which is related to a fault gene that you can find in the X chromosome, something that you see much more often in, in girls and in boys. Because if boys have it, that's basically a uh, least uh, they don't know about more. Most other cases we don't know. And um, I think that the big problem of uh, our field is that we have been over-interpreting uh, sex differences. And uh, Larry alluded to it. So um, a couple of years ago, I, I thought, OK, after trying to hunt down the function of the sex differences that I showed you in face uh, and find some other stuff that I speak, speak about later. It might be that, that when you find a difference in the brain, you might do more than just cause a difference in the output. It might be that also to uh, compensate for something else, a difference something else, so that you don't get a, a difference that you're not interested in. So that's the, the punchline. It's better to uh, start with it so that you get an idea of, of what trend I'd like to get your thinking on. Here I say that. So the dual uh, function of sex differences is you need them to get differences in behaviors and in function. Obviously, when you want to have something like sex differences, in, uh, when you want to get male sexual behavior, and you want to have it being expressed more in males and females, you have to do something to that animal that increases the amount of behavior. Um, but just as well, you might need these differences to make sure that you don't get differences based on both. And, and I think that this is true for sex differences at whatever level of biological organization you're looking at. And in fact, it's easier to explain it at the molecular level. Again, with, I think, something that you uh, might have heard of. Um, so this is an interesting study. It was done uh, by a group in Sweden, and they compared gene expression um, between three primates. And in each case, they compared males and females. And, and the lady can read this. Every um, column is a comparison of one individual and another. Uh, every row here is, is a different gene. If you see a yellow square, it means that there's higher expression in the female than in the male. If it's blue, it's the opposite. If it's black, it's sort of the And if you uh, did this because you're interested in trying the genes that could contribute to sex differences in behavior, you should have been very excited by finding a couple of clear differences. But if you look at, say, the second one, each of the binding goes in one, um, which is important for uh, binding each of the uh, protein. Um, <coughs> that particular thing has been implicated in the stress response, which, as some of you might know, uh, shows big sex differences. So you might say, hey, I might be on track of finding uh, uh, something that contributes to sex differences in stress response. But the second one, or the first one in this, exists, as you might know, is uh, something that. Um, you find exclusively um, being expressed in females. It's basically a, a, a messenger RNA. It doesn't get translated. And it's used to paint one of the two X chromosomes. Covered almost all over. And here you see a large dog from the preparation. Even in the females, you don't see it. <coughs> and we think that really the only reason that that's done is to make sure that you don't get double dosage X chromosome genes in um, So here is huge sex evidence that you have in every cell of your body, in, in every mammal that you see around you, you see that same sex evidence. It's extremely uh, uh, big. And it's there almost from, from, from inception. Um, not exactly, but, but uh, a couple of cell divisions into the embryo, you're going to see X in activation. And it's there, really just to make sure that the female develops the same as the male. It's a new brain story. Now, to give you an idea of how I got this 
that that could conflict with sex differences too. Because when you start thinking, of course, it is that difference that causes there to be a lesser life. But it's that difference that might also act on other tissues <coughs> in the brain and in other uh, 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 genes in the body, and that might contribute to the sex differences that you see. And we have been choosing and picking and, and finding all kinds of things that fit quite well in this 20th century model, thereby believing it stronger and stronger without ever really testing that, that hypothesis. Um, well, phase depressing seems to be uh, affected by uh, really the three different sets of uh, big factors that make tissue sexually demorphic. For one thing, um, it is influenced by genetic steroids during development. So we did a series of experiments that showed that here you see this one of them here castrated males at different times during development. If you did that neonatally, we got something that Female, and we did it when the animals were three weeks old. You got something that looked like what you see here in the male. And around uh, day seven, we get something intermediate. We get a reverse testosterone too, and also different types of uh, birth. And again, around day seven, could we push this uh, innovation in the male direction? So hormones during development, if you think in the 20th century model, right, uh, push the male development, the face pressing innovation in the male direction. But there is more. Um, this system itself is one of the most exquisitely sensitive systems. It's exquisitely hormone sensitive system that you can find in the brain. So here you see uh, that same area that you literally see that sex difference. But you see you're also face addressing that comes from the superkinds of activities. If you look at an animal that doesn't have hormones on board, then you see that this entire area is not expressed anymore. If you look at the level of the cells, there's no message to be made to those cells. But happens in the uh, virus of the superkaiser the nucleus. Also much happens in the virus that come from the virus of the and the super nucleus. So it's these bad nucleus and these amygdala cells that are exquisitely sensitive to granular steroids. But if you if you remember how I started this story, um, speaking about these neonatal castrations, so here's a system that is sensitive to hormones in two different ways. Early in life, it gets from the male or the female. But of course, it says this is sensitive to the male steroids. Um, differences that you see that circulate in the hormones add to the sex differences that you see. Like if you take a mouse and you say it for face pressing, you see a huge sex differences. And that's in part related to the circulating in the If you equate the hormone levels in males and females, the sex difference is still there. Probably it grows by this earlier but it's much less big. This is also a system where um, uh, sex chromosomes seem to have a direct effect. And um, we, we show that by using a, uh, a corpus that was sort of invented by uh, Art Arnold working together with a very smart uh, geneticist in England, Paul Bourgogne. And uh, they came up with what is now called the four core uh, genotype of mice. And the thing is this you, of course, you have a female if you have two X chromosomes. So these white things now stand in for female X chromosomes. So you get a male if you have a. Um, what can I do? Can I do it from the wrong? I'm very done it from the wrong one, but let's say you get a male when you get a. Uh, and then you have an SRY gene. Oh, this is <coughs> okay, so I do it right. Um, let's say they have an animal uh, that has a spontaneous uh, lesion of the S, the region that has the SRY gene. That animal was an XY animal, but developed as a male. And we also made a mouse with a um, SRY trans gene that was placed in an autosomal location. And that was, of course, a way to make an XX male. And when you cross this animal with this animal, you go with these four different things. So this allows you to make a comparison of um, having two X's, or an X and a Y, in the female phenotype, and the same in the male phenotype. And then when we looked at sex differences in the brain, in most cases, there was absolutely no effect of sex chromosomes. But the face-pressing innovation was, uh, was different. 
<coughs> and we got rather risky uh, results. We were just MF1 mice, but um, ArchLab brought in uh, the same uh, proper uh, genotype over to a CD. Uh, uh, Black six, CD5, six, back. Uh, right. And, and uh, in that background, you saw a huge difference in uh, uh, that was caused by the sex chromosomes. So here, for instance, you have the females. They call them females because they have ovaries. Um, and these are the males. They call them males because they have testes. And these guys get tested because they have, they have an SRI transgene. These guys. <coughs> stay female because they don't have any SRI gene on board whatsoever. So if you take sort of the average between these two and you compare it to that, that's probably what the difference that's caused by the breast is. If you look with the sex, the difference that you see here, that's probably a difference that is directly related to sex chromosomes. So we know that we have an interesting sex difference on our head. <laughs> It's um, caused by sex differences in male hormones around birth, later on in life, and by having uh, an XX or an XY component of sex chromosomes. Now, when I was um, studying this for, um, I believe, for over 10 years, uh, and just being interested in how you get the sex differences and so forth and so forth, I suddenly got a grant uh, review back. Uh, that said, there have been decades of research on sex differences in the brain, and a functional correlate has yet to be found. I, I know that sentence so well because it annoyed me so quickly. Um, but just for a couple of days, until I realized that yeah, that's true. In most cases, we have no clue what sex differences are doing in the brain. And that was at the time that um, we started working with folks. I can do the early 90s or so. And I thought, okay, it makes sense to work with animals like folks hamsters or animals that, uh, that show fluctuations in the male hormone levels, not because you take out a donut, but because something changes in the environment for good, uh, uh, behavioral and biological reasons. So we thought, okay, let's work on those guys for a while. And um, it changed my thinking about itself. So in the 20th century, um, the people asked, what is the system doing? Instead of uh, the answer, I said, well, the problem it means that this person is involved in uh, sexually dimorphic function, or at least the function that is strongly influenced by chemical therapies. I always said that, and nobody ever um, disagreed. So they probably thought that that sounded rather smart. But that, that thinking um, did go just as far as, as the railroad tracks underneath the Petit Science Center in the land where I'm working. <laughs> I've heard people describe so I love it and I'm extremely charmed by it and it's the smartest decision I've made I think in my professional career but I've heard people describe the city as, as a collection of projects that get started and then never end so I don't think that's one that is going or, or, or is coming and when it's coming I hope they change it in that direction my office is right above that <laughs> But back to, back to the, f the functions. <coughs> so one of the nice things of work on vasopressin is that you work on the neuropeptide that really was with ACTH, the first peptide to be called neuropeptide. So this is, this is uh, some spectral research that started in the late 50s, early 60s, and uh, the beat teams, maybe a bit like that, found that if you injected these peptides, you got strong effects of the So it suggested that these peptides that the nerves were made by the brain or by the anterior pituitary. They had neurotropic functions, and for that reason, they called them neuropeptides. And then later, uh, people found out that wait a moment, um, these things don't really go back on the brain, they're made in the brain, and, and that's probably how they have these actions on, on these brain functions. But for that reason, many, many people have studied this system, and many people actually have looked at the function of even the fibers that I'm so interested in. So this is a list of functions that have been, uh, um, that this system has been implicated in. But when you go down to this, you see there's a problem. Most of these things, thermal regulation, learning memory, also regulation, are not the dimorphic. You can find sex differences, but they are subtle. Um, 
So it's difficult to uh, correlate that, to justify my flippant answer of what face person is doing and sex evidence is doing. It just doesn't fit. Um, we changed our uh, view when we started working with practicals. This is a picture of Mary Bumshat who was uh, me to change. She was working in the lab of uh, Melinda Novak, colleague of the pure behavioral research, and was comparing at that time with Mary Bumshat and, uh, and um, metaphors. And um, looking at this interesting difference that you see in, in, uh, in parental behavior. So Miriam was interested in what do you see in oxytocin. Again, uh, me being a, a man of very limited imagination, <coughs> I could not imagine that just looking at oxytocin would make sense. So I talked her into also looking at face depression. And that's where, uh, at least for us, the more interesting story was. So she found that um, the very full male shows right after it's mated with a, uh, a female, a drop in the, the, the level of face depression in, in the sexual demographic areas. It comes up again to go down again and the pops the board. And I had a postdoc uh, over here for a while, Su Xin Wang, who looked at that same system at the level of the message. And he found the reverse. So when these guys were put together, the message went up. And that sort of suggested that the system starts going in overdrive then animals are mated, and then of course, um, um, it was Winslow, I think, and Jim Winslow that showed that if you gave um, space aggressive antagonists to uh, after mating, you could block the increase in aggression that you saw, and to some extent you could block uh, pair bonding, and he showed that increased space aggression was important for the tumor behavior. But um, one of the things, of course, is that we, that after for years trying to link this face present system with the sexually demographic uh, behavior, I ended up linking it to something that is spectacularly similar in the um, Because if you have a, a couple of prairie falls, if you look at it from the top, you have no clue who's the mom and who's the dad. If you lift them up, you can, by telling uh, the rest of the pups hanging at the belly, that who's the male and who's the female. But in terms of this behavior, this basically just linked this face present system, you could not. Not only that, this animal, uh, among all the animals that I've looked at, has absolutely the most impressive sex difference in face depression. So here we have an animal that has the most impressive uh, sex difference in face depression among the uh, mammals that we have looked at. And the behavior is spectacularly similar. And then um, it dawned on me that, that it actually makes sense in this case for parental behavior. So you might know that in rodents, the rodent females have to go through pregnancy. And in fact, in, in some species, have to, and those are one of them, have to actually give birth before they are fully pregnant. So if you have a species like prairie voles and you want the males to perform, you have to do something different for the males. The males never get pregnant, they never get birth. So you have to follow a different strategy. The different strategy might be you have to build them different. You have to build your brains different. And so, think that having the sex of a human in the, in the face of present system might be one of those building blocks that helps them to be uh, parental in most cases when they see a So that's how we came up with uh, this dual function theory. And then when you go back again, I just have to go back to the literature and look at the experiments that were done and they start falling into place. Um, so indeed, this difference might cause differences in behavior. I say male intermale aggression is one of them. You see it for more in males than females. It was researched on by Jan Kohlhaas group in Groningen that showed that um, if you castrated the male, of course you get this decline in, in aggressive behavior, you could sort of um, reverse it by giving these guys face aggression on the side. So that's the situation that seems to fit. <coughs> well, it's really the street view of what sex is happening in the brain. But the opposite is that had uh, also been done before we started thinking of this uh, um, idea. For instance, by a group uh, of Roger Danze, who had shown that face pressing in this system is important for social recognition. <coughs> uh, do I have to explain social recognition memory to this group? No, you guys know it. So they know, we know that they know that they recognize each other. And, and face pressing is important for that. And uh, giving antagonists they walk. But giving antagonists to females doesn't do much to change the behavior. So 
suggesting that Facebook is more important than buildings and fuel. Why? We don't know. It could be that it's one of those compensatory mechanisms. There's an effect. Um, research done here in Emory that I want to briefly speak about, and Larry can correct me uh, if I'm wrong. I always think that I'm right and I present this stuff from your lab. Uh, where uh, uh, real steam, I bought this piece. Oh, yes, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. okay. yeah. um, so, if you look in the males um, that, that John expressed the face pressing the female uh, A receptor, you see that you have a phenotype in anxiety related behaviors. So, without a receptor, they seem to be less anxious. If you look at uh, that same mutant, but now in females, you have not much of a phenotype. Again, something that fits with the idea. That um, that face breast is more important than sex. It's true even for uh, humans. So this is an interesting study that was published in the ETS not so long ago of a group in Sweden. We looked at pair bonding behavior in, in humans, and they looked at um, what the impact is of uh, variations in the motor regions of the V1A receptor in humans. I look at uh, receptors very much like the same that, that Larry's group has been looking at. And they um, found that there was one specific uh, uh, repeat, and, uh, the RS3, where there were, uh, I think it's number 8, do you remember that? It's research for that's the uh, variability that, okay, that, that seemed to correlate the spare bond behavior. If you had that, um, you were more likely to live together with your partner without being married, which is saw as, as a sign of less of a commitment than being married. If you were married, uh, you were more likely uh, than people who didn't have that polymorphism to have been in a serious marital crisis. If you weren't aware of that, that you asked the spouse of this individual uh, to rate the, their spouse's behavior, the spouse would say, super, I see my neighbor's street, they're dark, they're and so forth. But the interesting thing is that that correlation is found in males and not in females. Exactly uh, the way that you would expect um, when face press is more important to males than females. Now, this, this morning when I uh, went over my uh, slides, um, I, I found two things. There were too many. And there was an interesting uh, mistake in the title where I spoke about the neuropeptides, face pressing. And I went back to uh, my uh, email and I noticed that I promised to speak about the neuropeptides, face pressing, and oxytocin. And just by dumping it on that slide, it had been cut off in the program. And I thought, well, that's probably a divine intervention, and taking out the oxytocin in that story, um, which was mostly somebody else's data. But what is interesting is that the oxytocin system is sort of the same, but it's in the opposite direction. So you can find and some social behavior, and there is we're working on developing the story in there as well. Um, that sort of is going to mirror image, at least for this function, oxytocin, um, as the story that I just told you for face of um, Now, we thought, okay, we want to know more of this, and we want to get a piece of the action now shot. And we started, <coughs> let's stop this guy from playing, it's the huge. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's do it at uh, a time that few people are asking questions of what sex happens are doing. That's during development. And let's look at social behaviors. And the justification for that is, of course, that there are plenty of disorders of social behavior and autism and schizophrenia, that you see, of which you see the first signs during development before people reach adulthood. So you really want, and you see it very sexually demorphic. Um, so you really want to know what type of things might be happening in, in that age group. So we started working um, with face pressing, and I'm going to just show you three different sets of data that suggest that face pressing has something to do with social behavior during development. Um, let's talk about that. Here you see that's playing. It's pretty easy to get to work with this because people like looking at this. Here the lights go off, and this guy's instantly like that. An interesting phenomenon in itself. And I hope you can see it. Uh, they're sitting uh, each other and, and the story, and then they go ahead. 
the adults. Pushing past. And I think there's a little section that shows the same thing. Uh, again, one element, very characteristic thing that's uh, one animal jumps on the other, lunches for the neck, and then the other animal spins here just because it's totally impossible to see it. Uh, and uh, lunches, you see, goes to the neck. It's just a really <laughs> sign of play behavior, and the other animal still spins and it typically squeaks. Um, it seems to be uh, all fun and games, and nobody seems to be poking out an eye. And part of what you see is that people, uh, that, that, that these pups um, exchange roles. There's not one that's clearly done with the other. It's very different for it's the aggression that you see later on and when there is indeed instantly a, a division of roles. One will always be up with the other. Which the other will uh, prevent by always going away from the other. Let's say here are these three pieces of circumstantial evidence. One was uh, stuff where we started looking at the effect of uh, early and new uh, uh, challenges and the development of social behavior as well as the development of the system. And this is from Patrick Taylor and Paul. And they found that if, uh, if you looked at the offspring of animals that have been um, treated with LPS, you saw a big decrease in play behavior. I didn't see much in three months. And these are just the different elements of um, <coughs> You didn't see such things when animals were treated with the same. But if you look at the phase present innovation, that system that we're looking at, you can see mm -hmm. an area that we know is important, masculinization of play behavior. Uh, it's the same story. In addition to seeing this huge sex difference at that age, which again makes it so much more interesting to look at the function of the sex difference of that age group, we see that we get a decrease of face present message in the males, not in females. And that's of course pure correlation, and we are now trying to figure out, uh, using bread and butter rents, whether uh, the face of present system is involved. The preliminary data suggests yes, because we cannot uh, get uh, that same uh, um, sex difference in. Uh, in the red worlds. We don't see that same effect in other systems. So that is something unique for uh, the dynamics of the state violence. Not a piece of uh, more direct evidence. This is uh, uh, research that was done by Alex Venema, who was posted in my lab, and my husband, Renko Breedable. They injected P1A antagonists in a lateral ventricle uh, and it blocked the behavior in males. But, uh, from, uh, um, uh, but in females, they had sort of the opposite effect. It surprised us because we would have hoped to see nothing whatsoever. And what I don't, what I didn't do uh, on this slide, we didn't get it in the lens receptor. We got again the sex that is in the effect, but the effects went in the opposite direction. So this is one of those things that the reality is often much crazier than, uh, than we can dream up on paper. We have to figure out what's going on. The last uh, bit of uh, circumstantial evidence comes from research that we're doing at this point here at Georgia State. And we've gotten very interested in what happens when the brain emerges. Really, what changes in the brain for them to start doing certain behavior? And um, there's a couple of interesting things that are happening there from a sex difference perspective. For one thing, the sex difference that everybody typically knows about males show more of that rough and tumble behavior uh, than females. Um, in addition to that really being context dependent, because you can get rid of that sex difference if you pick your arena and you do the test. <laughs> it's the reverse in early development. The females show more uh, play behavior. We have shown this now in two strings and in, in two states of the United States of America. <laughs> and then Matt looks at what do you see at uh, face pressing. The message, do you see it coming up at about the same time? He sees a couple of interesting things. But the most interesting one is that um, he sees an almost perfect correlation between the level of face pressing message in that time point and the level of play behavior. So the less face pressing message, the more play behavior. So now we, we are interested in whether this has something to do with anxiety at that time, so the more anxious they are. This present being, as the Bielski stuff shows, uh, anxiogenic, uh, um, whether what we're looking at is um, a sex difference in anxiety. <coughs> so 
So stay tuned for that. Just briefly to get back to uh, these pair bonding uh, suites of uh, people that did show it. That same polymorphism, interestingly enough, had also been linked with uh, increased chances of developing autism. And as you know, that is, of course, something that is um, really suggesting that here, thinking about brains this way, that you have different neurochemical underpinnings with the same social behaviors, we hence you a solution why you might have sex differences in the incidence of disorders. The underlying machine differs. By necessity, uh, you're going to get different vulnerabilities. And I think um, you can look at some analogies. Car, as I mentioned, the next car has an engine to it a lot. And in all cases, the function is the same to so drive uh, kids to soccer or to go to the supermarket, etc., etc. But one car breaks down more often than the other. And one way to look at it is to see what type of intelligent design uh, was used to get the motor together. Or um, an analogy that I saw on the web um, something that people use for <laughs> <laughs> the Mac and the PC. Yeah, but of course, if you saw me wrestling, I heard I live in Mecca. And I don't think much and I support for people that say that that's the superior machine. It just looks much nicer. Anyway, I think that I skipped over this thing that I really want you to, to remember. So that if the neurosecurity online behavior differs by necessity, the vulnerability for disorders that you get in the system breaks down, differs. Um, now I want to, to spend just, say, two or three slides um, on just expanding this idea that we're talking about. So much of the thinking about sexual differentiation comes free from people studying brains. They were more interested in sex differences than almost any other people, except, of course, for neurologists and gynecologists and people that, that have big organs that they need no difference. Um, let's say this is also a, a big and a genome-wide association study that was done in the lab of Jay Usis, who together with Art Arnold, and they picked a number of um, uh, organs and just looked at expression differences. And much to their surprise, they found that the sex differences in expression were much bigger than they uh, had um, uh, previously assumed. So here you see just a number of genes that show a uh, twofold uh, reduction or twofold increase in one sex over the other. And you see that, uh, that in liver, in adipose tissue, and in fact, in almost any tissue that you pick, um, you see that same story. And what they did on top of it is here, how that, uh, how that story is for the X chromosome, which of course means inactivated. It's about the same story. And so, uh, you see that the right is this bone analysis of um, the metabolome. And it's again the same story. It's just about any system that you're looking at, the sex elements are extremely much bigger than, than I ever saw. And in fact, um, so they, they got this idea of you should think of the sex zone. As the sex zone, they meant all the factors that causes genes to be expressed in a different way. They, 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 they suggest that, of course, you can see the cell, the output of the cell, as the product of interactions of the whole collection of different genes. And you could think of phenol factors that push certain nodes stronger than on other nodes and that pushes whatever nodes are, are corresponding with these networks in a certain direction, let's say the female direction. And there are these male things. Um, and I like that idea, but I think you have to extend it and think beyond just genes and think again at different levels of organization and think of different organs doing the same. The, the kidney might uh, bring in different brain and might have consequences for the liver, etc. etc. And you don't even have to go that far to see examples of that. So if you stay with face pressing, and I stay with the guy that, that uh, I just spoke about, Joe from Bahamas, who thinks face pressing, I agree, is the most important problem in the body. If you look at the expression of the V2 receptor, it's just the uh, receptor that you need to prevent the diuretic action of face uh, pressing without it, from diuretic, and, and use more water than you, than you want to. Interestingly enough, at the level of the message, there's much more V2 uh, uh, receptor in females than in males. And if you look at the level of the proteins, you still see that, that sex difference. 
and that actually leads to functional differences. So, for instance, here they inject uh, desmopressin that increases weights, and it leads in the female in an increase in postmortem uh, uh, postmortem cures, your reserve hormone, and a decrease, a bigger decrease in the urine volume. And so, something like this could, for instance, contribute to uh, some of the uh, sex differences that people have seen in depression which is something that links to differences in other areas. So really, I would not have thought of starting to think of the kidney as something that could contribute to, to, uh, to depression, that alone to sex differences in depression. But um, I think it, it really warns us that if you could go into the 20th century model that Art Arnold spoke about, how you differentiate tissues in the soul, uh, the X chromosomes, the XY, the gonads, and the tissue, <coughs> For the gonads of the tissue, we try to, I always think, testis speaks to brain and brain changes. But why not testis speaks to liver, liver does something with the kidney, kidney does something with the immune system, etc. That speaks to the brain. And that's where your differences come from. And I think that the truth is probably going to be that it's going to be a combination of those things. And it's a very, very interesting thing to go after. And so I told you that I would make a pitch for this organization. Uh, it's a new organization. First year that we're independent. And um, people come there and speak about these problems. So you don't find just brain, people. you don't find just cardiovascular, that's a big area of sex differences. People are kidney people. They all come together and they listen to each other's stories. They have different uh, traditions of how to, how to approach these things. And it's extremely exciting to just um, come up with different ways of, of trying to figure out how these things work. Um, the only thing you have to remember is OSSD. 2013, if you want to go to this year's meeting. So what I want you to remember is that these differences in phase precedent it was the core of my study of cause as well as prevent differences. Each time that you find a difference in the brain, I want you to think of the two possibilities that they cause and they can uh, um, block differences. And if you do that type of thinking, you give yourself another explanation as to why there could be sex differences. Not just in brain, but in all kinds of other disorders in the body. So this is the thank you slide. Many people worked uh, on this, and many of them lived in Massachusetts. These are the people who lived in Massachusetts, where we lived in a very nice rural area. Now, of course, we moved to uh, Atlanta, and fortunately, we uh, populated the back end wonderful set of workers. <laughs>